All right, if you would, pull out your outlines. I'm very excited about the message that we have today. We are doing the Insider's Guide to Christmas. And so today I want to talk to you about an opportunity that you have that you might miss. Now, all of us have had opportunities in our life where we've missed something that's really important and you go, God, I wish I could have that back. Some of them are legendary, though, right? Some of these you know. Uh, in 1961, Decca Records turned down uh, the singing group The Beatles. And the person said, they're not very sellable. <laughs> Imagine that guy wants that back, right? Uh, Mars Candy, the, the director, the producer of uh, the movie E.T., wanted M&Ms in his movie, and they wouldn't, they said, no, we don't want to do that, and so they put in Reese's Pieces, and at the, after that movie, Reese's Pieces went up 65% just because of that movie, okay? Probably should have rethought that one, right? Western Union uh, refused to buy the patent by Alex Alexander Graham Bell for the telephone. They said, there's no future in the phone. <laughs> yeah, you'd like to do that. I love, you know, all the money they spend in, uh, for sports, especially, you know, in the football draft. Tom Brady, one of the best quarterbacks ever, drafted 199th. Somebody, you know, a lot of people made some mistakes there, right? 1954, Elvis Presley was fired by the manager of the Grand Old Opry. He said, you're not going to go anywhere, son. <laughs> so, you know, you've had misses in your life. Maybe they're not as big and legendary as that, but you miss big moments. And in those, you go, I wish I could have that back. So I want to talk to you about this season and a huge opportunity that you have. Today, we're going to look at people who experienced Christmas and why. We're going to look at people who miss Christmas, this incredible opportunity, once in a lifetime. I mean, they missed Jesus when he was there and why. And then we want to talk about how it is that you cannot miss this opportunity of a lifetime experiencing Christmas. Sound good? Here we go. All right. So last week, what we did, and just to bring you up in context of the story that we're going to read in Luke 2, is um, we, got, we, we saw that... Christmas is kind of messy, and that there shouldn't be a surprise in that, even though we're a mess, Christmas is a mess, because we, I asked the question, shouldn't we as believers, I mean, get it better, and shouldn't we understand? And it's kind of a tricky question, because in one sense, yeah, because we understand, but in another sense, no, because I want you to always remember, grace is more amazing than any of us imagine, but we are more broken than any of us want to admit. And see, Christmas is a judgment that's saying you can't fix yourself. Your self-improvement project is never going to work. Jesus would not have had to come from heaven and become human and die on a cross if you could fix yourself. You don't need just a little help. You need the help of a Savior. And so Christmas, we celebrate that we are a mess. And while grace is awesome, we're a mess. And so our Christmases are going to be messy because we're messy people. And the first Christmas we saw was a mess. The time was a mess. The people were a mess. And the place that Jesus was born was a mess. No child was ever born in a stable. They weren't born in mangers. I mean, that just didn't happen. I mean, it's a, it's a brutal place. And so, and it's, you know, Mary and Joseph were forgotten by their family. And so we saw all of the pain of that. And it was brutal. And so that's the context that we're in. And so it brings us up to Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And we're going to continue on in kind of the Christmas story. So all of you that brought your Bibles, you know, Merry Christmas to you. Blessings upon you. You're going to love this because you're going to mark your Bible, especially a couple characters that we're going to see. Great insights. The rest of you, you're going to have to wait to the end of the service for a blessing for you. No blessing right now. So watch this now very carefully. On the eighth day... When it came time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Now, this is eight days after Jesus was born. Where are Mary and Joyce, Joseph living now? Does not tell us. And do you know what I take from that? No family member stood up and helped him. They were living under this haze of the shame because of the whole story of their life. And even though this is Joseph's the extended family lives in Bethlehem. I think if somebody would have said, oh, come and live with us or we'll be there for you, their name would have gotten in the Bible. But you get a sense that the family still doesn't reach out to them. And so they're staying and at a very cost, a huge cost to them. And what I want you to see, and we'll come back to this a number of times, Mary and Joseph, it'll say through this passage, they, they did what the law commanded, of, commanded them. They did what God wanted them to do. And what I want you to see is that obedience always cost. It cost us something to be obedient. And you're going to see this. So Mary and Joseph are staying in the Bethlehem, Jerusalem area. 
And it costs them something because they're poor. Joseph doesn't have a job there, so he's probably doing everything he can to get whatever work that he can. And they stay on the eighth day. Now, in this next part, what I'm going to do is we're going to run through the Old Testament. So you're going to see three Old Testament sacrifices or celebrations that powerfully illustrate ultimately what Jesus is about. Now, what you need to understand in the Old Testament, remember, people didn't read in the Old Testament. And so God would give his people. So you see the loving heart of God. He would give them ways to, uh, to act out truths, to live the truths out in a life lesson so that it would teach parents and it would teach par- uh, their kids. And so when you see these, they were meant to be acted out in, in a way teach people who couldn't read books. So these are powerful ways. And this year, if you read through the Bible with me, you're going to get to see all of these things lived out. So it's very exciting, very exciting that we're going to do this. So three Old Testament celebrations. And the first one is circumcision. (laughs) Pretty exciting, right? And here's where it comes from, right? So on the eighth day, which is what the law said, they circumcised Jesus. And here's where it came from. In Genesis chapter 12, God called Abraham and Abraham followed. And he says, Abraham, you're going to be the father of faith. And I'm going to bless you. and I'm going to give you a land and I'm going to bless the whole world through you. And it's a covenant. A covenant was a promise that God gave that was unconditional. He says, I'm going to give you this promise that I'm going to bless the whole world through you. And then he gave a sign. Every time God made a covenant, an unconditional promise, he gave him a sign. Remember Noah? He says, I'm never going to destroy the world again through a flood. And I'm going to give you a sign. And the sign was a rainbow. And you understand diffraction of water and how it happens. But God didn't have to make it that way. And so God, it's a promise. We tell our children, God is never going to destroy the earth again with water. So God comes to Abraham and he says to Abraham, I am going to bless the whole world through you. And I'm going to give you a sign of this promise to you. And the sign was circumcision. To which Abraham said, can I have the rainbow? You know, <laughs> but it's a powerful thing. And you get a picture. This is why it's so powerful. Because eventually a son would say, you know, Dad, why am I different than others? And what is this about? And a father would say to a son, because it was always to teach a lesson. That's a sign that you belong to God. You are God's loved child. And it is also a sign that one day, God will send a savior, a deliverer, a rescuer that will bless the whole world. It's a very personal sign and God wanted it to be personal. And it's a sign to you, you are loved and God's going to bless the whole world. That's what circumcision was all about. And so they did what the law said. And then they named him Jesus. And, you know, most parents get to choose the name of a child, but Mary and Joseph didn't. This was the name that God chose. And Jesus means God rescues or God saves. It literally is Yahweh is salvation. And so you would have heard Jesus' name as Yeshua, Yahweh saves. And the reason it's the name is because we need a savior. We need somebody to rescue us. And then it goes on. And now look at these other things. You're going to see two more ceremonies that are here. When the time came for um, his name, Jesus. Okay. And when the time came for the purification, right? That's one. So we're going to talk about that. Required by the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This was 40 days later. And he goes, and it was written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. So it's, it happened on the 40th day. So it's about 32 days after this. To offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there are two sacrifices here. Rite of purification and then the rite of redemption or uh, the firstborn. And so I want to explain both of them to you. Because they're in the Old Testament. We're going to read it together. You'll understand it. Here's what it is. In the Old Testament, there's this giant theme of being clean and unclean. <clears throat> and it was a way, again, for people to act out a truth. And what would happen is, during the course of your life, everyday things, you would become unclean. Because here's the question. How can people who are unholy and unrighteous and impure come into the presence of God? How is it possible for unholy people to have a relationship with God? And so, God found a way. It's always God acting. And he says, this is what you do because through the course of events, there will be times that you become unclean, ceremonial. It's not the same as a sin offering. A sin offering was something different. You know what was wrong. You did a swan dive into sin. You would have to do an offering for this. But this just happened in the course of life. And having a child, going through pregnancy and birth was a way that you would become ceremonially unclean. 
But God had a way for you to become clean. And what you would do is you would go to the temple 40 days after you gave birth and you would buy a sacrifice. And so there were three levels of sacrifices because obedience always... Good, some of you got it. Remember the words cost? And so you want to say it right there. So obedience always... It cost us something to say yes to God. So you would go to the temple and depending on how wealthy you were, you bought a sacrifice and that you give it to the priest. The priest would kill the animal. And what it was a picture of is this innocent animal dies, sheds its blood so that you can be made pure. One day, someone will come. God will send a deliverer, a rescue, and he will Give his life so that you can be pure, you can be righteous, you can be made clean. And that day now is happening right when Jesus is here. Jesus comes to make us clean, the rite of purification. Isn't that amazing? Clean and unclean, all fulfilled in Jesus. And then there's the rite of the firstborn. Every firstborn male had to be brought to the temple and be dedicated. And literally what the Bible says, and when your children ask, what does this mean? You will say to them, boys and girls, boys and girls. Watch, watch, watch. Listen, listen, listen. See, because it's an important lesson. Parents would say, this is why we do this. When you dedicate your firstborn male son, you will tell your children, when we were slaves in Egypt and we were lost and in slavery, we cried out to God. God heard our cries and he delivered us with his mighty strong hand. There were 10 plagues and the last plague was the death of the firstborn male in every family. But... If you followed what God said, God provided a way. You would take a lamb, bring him into your house. On the 14th day, you would slay the lamb. Then you would slaughter it. You would eat it that night. You would take the blood of that lamb, put it on the doorpost. And if you put it on the doorpost, the death angel would pass over you, called the Passover. But you will celebrate it every time that you have the birth of a firstborn male son because you'll say, this son belongs to God. And you take him to the temple and you'll pay for him. So you come to the temple, you'd actually hand your child to a priest. Then you would give Give them money, few pieces of silver, because obedience always cost. It always cost to say yes. And so, and then you would buy your child back the same way. God bought us out of the slavery. One day he will send a savior, a rescuer, who will buy us out of the slavery of sin, which is what Jesus does on the cross. We are literally bought. We sold ourselves cheap to the slave, you know, to the slavery of sin, but God buys us back. And the biblical word is redeem or redemption, to buy out. And so you're redeeming your firstborn son, just like God will redeem all of us out of sin. A way to actually act that truth out. Okay, a lot of sight. Now, okay, if you didn't pay attention, there's my sweep through the Old Testament. So here's the point. Mary and Joseph are going through at a very big cost. They're staying in Bethlehem. Nobody in their family has stood up for them. They're, Joseph is finding every odd job that he can. They're renting a room. They live under the shame. Nobody in their family cares for them and they're making it on themselves. It's been 11 months since they, an angel has spoken to them. It's for 11 months. Everybody spoke behind their back in Nazareth. Nobody believed them. Then they showed up in Bethlehem. The family doesn't stand with them. They're alone. They feel forgotten. They feel overwhelmed. Mary and Joseph are just doing what God has told them to do. Circumcision, then purification, then this rite of redemption. And they're going through what the law taught them to do because that's what God told them to do. And I think they come to the Temple Mount, which we're going to read about, and they are discouraged. They are overwhelmed. It's a long time. You know, they're just going, it's hard, just like young parents are, overwhelmed with a new child, nobody supporting them, alone and forgotten, and they come to the temple, but they don't miss Christmas, and I want you to see why, and here's why. So, here's the important place, the te- or to understand, the temple is a 25-acre plaza area. It's just like we have, the bottom half of our campus is about 25 acres. The temple would be a little bit smaller than our chapel. It was the most holy place on earth. It was the place of God's presence. It was 25 acres and it's kind of hardscape except for a few places where there's olive trees. It's where you see the dome on the rock now. Huge place. It was the center of town. It was the place where people would come to do all of these festivals like purification and and the sin offering or the right. I mean, lots of people had to come to do spiritual work with God. Then lots of people just came because it was a place of business. Lots of people came because it was the center of the city. There would be thousands and thousands of people every day on the Temple Mount. It was a busy place, things going on. Mary and Joseph are walking up onto the Temple Mount, alone, isolated, beat up, sad, just doing 
what God had told them to do, and it was costly. They stayed in Bethlehem, which cost them a lot, just working at every job. These offerings and sacrifices would cost them something, but they're doing what God called them to do. And right in that moment, look at what happens. And this is emotional and powerful. It says, Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He's an outsider. He has no official title. He's just a guy who loves God. And it says, And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, the comfort of God, for God to fulfill all of his promises that he's made all through the Old Testament. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he saw the Lord's Messiah, the Savior, this Yahshua. Messiah is uh, the Hebrew word. Christ is the Greek word. And so he was moved by the Spirit. He went to the temple courts. And when the parents were bringing the child to do for him what was the custom of the law required, it says Simeon took him, Jesus, in his arms and praised God. Now, here's a question I want to ask you. How do you think Simeon got Jesus in his arms? You think a stranger just walks up to a first-time mom with a one-month-old child and says, I've been led by the Holy Spirit, and can I have your kid for a second? Come on, yes or no? You're giving your kid over? I guarantee you, you're not giving your kid over. I remember when we had our first son, uh, you know, just about a month old, and we were walking down on the peninsula. This guy, you know, took an interest in, you know, the son. And she goes, oh, that's a brand new baby. Can I see him? And they're trying to grab him. And Lori's kind of moving away and pushing. And finally, she just goes, wham, and kicks him really hard. Goes, back off. And I had to jump in between him. He's like, whoa, whoa. He goes, moms do not hand their kids over. So how did Jesus get in Simeon's hands? Because when you read the Bible, God just invites you to use your imagination with what you have. And it's pretty obvious what they know. And I'll tell you how I think it goes. This is Kenton in the white spaces, but I think it's right. I think that Simeon walks up to to Mary and Joseph, led by God, and he says, you know, I don't want to interrupt you, and I know you're doing some things, but can I tell you my story? He says, you know, this is my story. All my life, I've been longing to see God do what he promised. All through the Old Testament, he promised that he would deliver, he would rescue and save. And this world is a broken place. There is hatred and jealousy and oppression. And we are oppressed and people are oppressed. And there's sadness. But God promised that he would would love us. He would rescue us. And not just us, but the whole world. And that he'd ultimately send a rescuer, a savior, that would stop the oppression, stop the injustice. And there's one thing I want in my whole life is that I want to see God's Messiah. I want to see the one who's going to come and rescue him. And I know this might sound crazy. I know it sounds crazy. But God told me that I would get to see him before I died. And I'm old. I get that I'm old. I'm very old, you're going to see in this story. He goes, but you know what? I was led here today, and I don't know why, but I saw you, and I was led towards you, and I'm not sure what it is. Maybe you know somebody, or maybe you are somebody, but, I, but, I'm, but this is the one passion of my life, and that's my story. And he kind of just stops right there. And I think after he tells his story, I think Joseph tells his story. And Joseph says, you know, it's amazing what you said. Because about 10, 11 months ago, an angel showed up to Mary. And he says, you're going to give birth to a son. It's going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. He's going to be the son of God. And I personally didn't even believe it when it happened. And so an angel had to show up to me and said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Because it's true. What she says is true. And you're to name him Jesus, which means Yeshua or God saves. God is your salvation. And he says, it's been hard. I think they're overwhelmed because no one's believed us. And nobody said, we even showed up in Bethlehem. And there wasn't even any room. And we had to give birth to him in a stable. But shepherds showed up. Because angels showed up to them. And they said, I bring you good news of great joy for all the people born to you. In this town of David is a Savior. And he is Christ. Greek word, Messiah. The Lord. And we're just coming up here to do what the law tells us. And I think that... Simeon breaks into tears because you know the one thing I know, old people cry more. And I think he does and I think he breaks into tears at this point. And he says, you know, all my life, all I wanted to do is to see God 
save. I wanted to see God rescue. I wanted to see God do what he promised to do. And you know what? I have Simeon's heart. I connect with this because it's what I want. It's what you want. Don't you want to see your friends be saved and rescued and understand that they're the broken relationship that they have with God can be healed? And don't you want to see fathers love their children and fathers love their wives and so that families are the way that they should because that's what Jesus does in a people's life. And he brings purpose and meaning. And I want to see Jesus. And I want to see Jesus bring purpose and meaning to people's lives that are lost and they don't even know why they're here. And I want to see Jesus because it promises that when Jesus returns the second time, that he will destroy all oppression and injustice and he will destroy hatred and he'll destroy wars. And when we get to see Jesus, there won't any be any more wars or sadness or disease. There won't be any more cancer. There won't be any more battered children. No more lost children. There will be no more souls tortured by addiction. I want to see Jesus. Don't you want to see Jesus? And I think somehow Simeon captures that in tears and he's going, oh my gosh. And he's looking at a baby and he believes in great. And he says, this is God's salvation. This baby is God's deliverer. And in tears, he's going, I can't believe it. And he says, could I hold him? What do you think she says now? I think that's how he got to hold Jesus. And other than Mary and Joseph, it's the only other person we know that got to hold Jesus. The only other name. He gets to hold Jesus. Because he says, I want God to bring the good into my, to this world, to my neighborhood, to my friends. The good that God had promised. And now he's holding Jesus in his arms. Look at the monster faith that this guy has. He's looking at a baby and he sees God's salvation and he knows he will not live to see it. But he just bust out and prays. Look at what he says. Simeon took him into his arms and he prays God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now you can dismiss your servant in peace. See, only old people say things like that. I can die happy now, right? So they do it. For my eyes have seen your salvation, affirms the name Jesus, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. It's not just for Israel. All nations, it's all ethnic groups, all people, worldwide savior. And a light in this dark world, you've brought a light that's a revelation to the Gentiles and he's the glory to your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him because they came up, they were beat up, they were tired, they're overwhelmed and they marvel at what he says because he goes, look at this. And they don't miss Christmas because he intersects them at this moment where they're just going through and doing what God told them to do. And then he goes on and he says what we all know is true about Jesus. And Simon blessed them. He blesses both Mary and Joseph. And he says to them, this child is destined to cause the rising, the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. What is he saying there? He's saying, you know what? This Jesus is going to be the great dividing line of all humanity. There are going to be some people that are looking at Jesus and they're going, I don't need him, don't need a savior, don't need a rescue, got it, can manage it on my own, and it's going to lead to their own destruction. And there will be others that will see Jesus and say, I can't do it. I can't fix myself, I can't purify myself, I can't save myself, I cannot redeem myself out of the brokenness of my own life. And only God can, only Jesus can, and he did it through the cross. And they're going to bow, they're going to humble themselves before Jesus, and in doing that, they're going to save their own life. And it's true. Is there a more divisive person who's ever lived than Jesus? You bring up Jesus, even today in any conversation, you are going to get a reaction. People are going to go, oh, don't need him. Don't give me the only savior, don't exclusive. That's nice teacher, but not savior. Or you're going to get people that go, he is my savior. He is my God. He is the dividing line of history. And then he turns to Mary and says, a sword will pierce your own soul too. And I think that this was encouragement that Mary needed because in the future years, she's going to see Jesus be rejected in Nazareth. 
going to see him rejected by the religious leaders, go to the cross. And he's saying, this is going to be painful. Mary knows. And so he is just busting out in this story, and he is overwhelmed. And right at that moment, another old person comes into the story. So here's good news for all of us that are old. And he says, um, and Anna, the daughter of Penuel, the, uh, the tribe of Asher, she was, she's very old, all right? I mean, that's just, there's your, very old. She had lived with her husband seven years. Girls got married, say, at 13, so seven years puts her at 20. And after her marriage, her husband died, and so she's a widow. And the Greeks say she was a widow for 84 years, or she's 84 years old. They can't tell. So she's either 104 or 84, but either way, she is seriously old. <clears throat> and look at what it says about her. She is a warrior princess. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day for from 20 on up to 84, or however old she is, every day she's at the temple. And she is worshiping and fasting and praying. And she was a prophet. It says, and coming up to them that very moment, she gives thanks to God. And she spoke about the child who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. Here she is. Now, here's what we know. Women were second-class citizens in this day, and widows had no rights. I mean, they were totally exposed. If you did not support them and give to them, they would die. No one listened to a widow. And here it is. This outsider is the one that sees it. She's a widow, but she's a prophet. She speaks God's word. She's a, she prays every day. She worships. She's there. And she's telling everyone about the redemption of her, that God is going to buy us back out of sin. And she comes up that moment and she just busts into praise. And she's thanking God for what he does. And she's overwhelmed. And how many people responded to Anna? whole lot of no one doesn't say i mean she proclaims it and so look at the people who find christmas two old people anna because she is this warrior princess holding on to god's word worshiping god praying every day looking forward god do what you promise god do what you promise would you redeem would you save would you buy us out of this slavery and then simeon simeon a guy who's righteous and devout he's an outsider But here's a guy who's longing, saying, God, would you do what you promised? Would you bring comfort? Would you bring peace? Would you bring love? Would you rescue and would you save? And do you know what I love? Is that Mary and Joseph find Christmas. And how is it that they find Christmas? Because they're doing what God said. And obedience always costs. And it costs them a lot. And here they are plowing through, their young parents, overwhelmed, nobody's standing with them. They're coming up to the temple to do these incredible celebrations that are written about in the Old Testament. And they've kind of lost it. And just before it happens, Simeon comes up and he blesses them and loves them and talks about who their child is. And Anna jumps into it too. And you know, all week I've been emotional about this passage. And here's why. Because in my life, I have had simians in my life. People who in the most difficult, challenging moments in my life, when I wasn't sure, I didn't understand, I was kind of losing it. They were people who said, but you know what, look to Jesus. Look at what Jesus is doing. And they would remind me that God is a deliverer. God is a rescue in this dark world. God has brought a great light and it is Jesus. And they would go, I want to see Jesus. Let's just focus on who Jesus is. And though there's hatred and hostility and there's brokenness in the world, Jesus is working on that. He's bringing light into this dark world. And he's rescuing and he's saving and he's delivering. And we aren't hopeless because he is the one who changes people's life and he's changing people's lives. I have had awesome simians. And you know where I found them? Same place they found them. Temple's the most holy place, but the only place like it today would be a church. And so they found it in a church, and it's where I found it. I found it in the church. People like you. And you know what? I'm emotional for a second reason. Because I want to be a Simeon. I'm an older person now. I'm old. So all of you that are my age or older, you get to be with me, and you're old. So I pronounce you old. (laughs) And what is it that you know that people who are not old don't know? What is it that all you old people know? You know that God is good? You know that God is good all the time. You know that God is loving. You know that the only hope that we have is Jesus. And that while there's all this stuff in Christmas that Jesus really is the meaning behind the whole season, 
And the only hope that we have, really, the only hope. And what I want to do, I want to be a Simeon to my family. I want to be a Simeon to you. I want to be a Simeon to people in my life that are lost and confused and say, in this world is dark. I get it. There's hatred and jealousy and oppression. But Jesus has come into the world to bring love and comfort and hope. I want people who are far from God, who are lost and they don't even understand the purpose of their life. I want them to be reconnected with God through Jesus because I want them to see Jesus. I want them to see Jesus so that their families are reunited. And they can be the kind of husbands that they're called to be. They can be loving husbands. They can love their children because that's what Jesus does to men. He changes them radically changes them. I want to be the person who directs them towards Jesus, makes them believe in Jesus. I want them to see Jesus. I want to be the person who sees Jesus in the most difficult moments of life. And for those of you that are younger, going through the motions, and I get obedience is costly. I get it. And some of you are losing the way or going, why do I do this? Why do I do it? Why should I stick by this stuff? Why should I stand by the door? Why should I do just what God said? I want to be the person who comes to you in that moment and say, because you know what God's doing right now? He is saving. He is rescuing. And following him is the only way to live. And it's worth it. It's worth it because I know it's worth it. And I know that you don't know it's worth it because you've lived just a few years. But it's worth it. I know that. And all of you that are old, you know it too. And I'll tell you, we're the ones that are going to help our families find Christmas. We're the ones that are going to help our church find Christmas. We're the ones that are going to make sure that Christmas happens because we're going to be the ones that stand up and say, I'm going to be an Anna. I'm going to be a Simeon. Now, there are people who miss Christmas in this story. And I'm just going to skip over them real quick because it's, a, it's an awesome warning. Because it happens. Who are the people that are not named that are in the story? The priests and the crowd. Is that amazing? The priests are people who miss Christmas. It's the priests. Here's a person that's doing circumcision, only a priest would do it, celebrating that God, you know, God loves his people and God, God is going to save his people. And literally, he's holding Jesus, the Savior. He misses it. He doesn't even know because he's busy doing religious stuff. The priest, one doing purification. The other one had to hold Jesus because he actually took Jesus and gave him back as he bought him back. So Jesus, you know, God would buy us out of sin. These important things. Neither one of them saw it. Why? They were busy doing good things. They were busy doing religious things. They were just busy in the moment and they didn't see it. Because the story was familiar to them and they missed the wonder of what happened. They missed it. And then the crowd. The crowd misses. They hear Simeon crying out. Anna goes and tells everybody. But they miss it. Why? Because they're busy with seasonal activities. Jesus is a baby. Nobody expected that. So, you know, who's going to believe it's a baby? They didn't need a savior. They're going, I'm not sure I really need saving. I got it. I got this. Can handle it. Can handle all the problems. Also, these people miss Christmas. And you know what's sad? It's the same reason we're going to miss Christmas. Why would you miss Christmas? I could miss Christmas just like these priests did. I mean, I'm the priest, right? And I can be doing all sorts of religious stuff. I can be going through all of our six Christmas Eve services. I can do all sorts of good things. But you can miss Jesus doing good things. And the priest did. Or because the story, you know, that's my danger. What's your danger? Maybe because the story is just so familiar... Or maybe it's just the busyness of the season. You got a lot to do. There's parties to go to, gifts to buy. You got a plan. You know, you got year end, so you got to do all of that in addition to the work that you're doing. And maybe you're going to do a family vacation. You, you got things to do. You're just busy. And you're just trying to smash Christmas and Jesus in with everything else. But He's everything. He's everything during this season. Or maybe it's because you just. You know, it's different than you expect. You're so, you want this perfect Christmas and it's messy. And we learn Jesus shows up in the mess. And you'll miss Jesus because he's just going to be in a different place doing something that you didn't expect. The story, you know, why is it that you're going to miss Christmas? Do you know what I love about this story? Nobody finds Christmas by themselves. 
Simeon didn't, it wasn't just him by himself. It wasn't Anna by himself. It wasn't Mary or Joseph by themselves. Elizabeth, Zechariah wasn't by themselves. Shepherds, I mean, everybody depended on somebody else. And what I love, it's a beautiful picture of what a church is. We are a partnership of generations. And you don't have to find Christmas on yourself. It's not you walking the beach and just going alone with God and I'll find it, I'll find it, I'll just find it. You know, a lot of it is we're here to help each other. And we have to help each other find it. And so for those of us that are old, you're going to be the ones that say, I'm going to make sure it happens for these people that I love, for my family, the people in my church, people in my life group. Because the passion of my heart is I want to see Jesus. And I'm not going to let the people in my life miss Jesus during this season. Into this dark world, there has come a great light. He continues to transform people's lives. He brings healing in broken relationships. He can restore a family. He can restore broken relationships. He can heal your broken heart. Jesus is the answer. And if people see Jesus and they see what Jesus is working, I mean, they can be reconnected to God. They can be reconnected to their families. They can find the purpose that they long for in life. Jesus is everything. And when we get overwhelmed by the hostility, the brokenness, the killings that go on, we say, but Jesus, one day he's going to come and he's going to make things right. And things in this world is going to be the way that it should be because that's what I want. Because Jesus is the answer. I'm going to be that person. For all of us that are in the older generation, I'm going to say, that's what I'm going to be. Because I think that for lots of you that are younger, you know, especially those of you with young kids, I mean, you're just slugging it through, right? I mean, trying to get it right, get the gifts, pull it together and do everything. And, you know, you are tired and you think you will never not be tired. And we get it. But you know what we know? We know. Jesus is the reason. We know that God is good all the time. We know that faithful obedience counts and it matters. It's important for you to do it. And yes, obedience costs. It's going to cost you something to follow God. If it doesn't cost you anything, you are not following God. But it's worth it. It is worth it. You will be where you, when you are in the right place, God will show up. You know what I love in a Christmas story? We didn't talk about it. But Elizabeth and Zachariah, who I guess are... Uh, you know, say they're 50, 60 to 40, somewhere in there. God shows up in a way, and they had a dream that they thought would never happen, and their story in Christmas is God did for them what they never thought was possible anymore. And then the shepherds who I think are, you know, those young professionals, say they're 30 to 45, you know how they found Christmas? They weren't afraid to take time off from their work to go find it. You know, the she- angel showed up and they said, hey, Good news, great joy. Now go. And they weren't afraid to go find Jesus. Take some time off because they go, this is the most important thing. And maybe some of you need to be a shepherd where you go, you know what? I can't just beat through this. I need to take some moments and I need to find Jesus. But ultimately, the good news is you don't have to just do it on your own. You can find it with God's people. So my question to you is this. What would it take this year for you to experience Christmas? What's, what are the things that might cause you to miss it? You know, busy, activity, doing lots of good things, so many good things that you're missing the best thing. What would it take for you to experience Christmas? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Just take a moment to talk to your Heavenly Father. And would you ask Him that question? Say, Father, God, what would it take for me to see Jesus in this season? to experience Jesus, to know Jesus, to see what Jesus is doing. What would it take? What changes would you need to make? Course corrections. And then secondly, will you say this to your Heavenly Father? You say, this Christmas, I need Jesus. I need to see Jesus. I need to see his salvation, his deliverance, his love, his comfort. God promises so many incredibly great things. God, I want to see you do what you said you would do. Would you bring your healing? Would you bring reconciliation? Would you change this person's life? God, would you do what you promised? Restore, heal, 
and meant, I want to see Jesus. Would you ask your Heavenly Father right now, God, would you let me see Jesus this Christmas?